Jason Step with Step Manufacturing, and today uh, we're going to go over this SPF uh, 500 gallon uh, bottom fired kettle. Today uh, we're going to go over the operations and, and uh, maintenance and things that you'll need to know about this unit. It's a pretty simple, easy unit to operate, so we'll just get right to it. Uh, I always like to start at the front of the trailer. Um, the trailer's got an adjustable hitch. Make sure that you get the trailer as level as you can because obviously you got a liquid product inside there and uh, you do have a vent and an overflow in it and if you get too high or too low you, you'll lose some capacity also because you'll get that tank too too angled. Uh, the axles do have an equalizer on them so if they're not perfectly level it's fine uh, but you do want to get it as level as you can. Uh, you got safety chains, you've got your light plug that does come, this particular unit has a six pin light plug. Uh, you can also get them with a seven pin RV or a seven uh, round tractor trailer. Uh, one of the things I like to talk about is this breakaway um, controller. Uh, so in the event of a disconnect, this is going to pull out. I'll show you it pulls out. Obviously, if the trailer comes disconnected, it locks the brakes up. Uh, this is one of those things that I see quite a bit um, on older units that isn't maintained. Uh, that there is really there to protect you as the commercial truck driver. Uh, in the event of a disconnect, it locks the brakes up and hopefully stops that unit quickly. Um, so make sure you hook that up. It's just one of those things that I always, you know, talk a little bit about. Uh, right behind the hitch, we have our battery box. It's a Group 24 deep cycle battery. Nothing too special there. Uh, hydraulic oil. Um, this unit is driven by a Kohler LP, uh, LPG engine. So the Kohler's uh, got an LP carburetor on it. It does drive a hydraulic pump. Uh, so you've got some hydraulic oil in here. The hydraulic oil is nothing too special. It's it's just an all-weather uh, an AW32. Uh, your dipstick for your engines here. Your fill is here. The filter is actually on the back side. Excuse me, along with the uh, uh, vaporizer. The vaporizer is located next to the muffler so that it gets some heat and can vaporize that LP. Um, you've got your throttle here. Um, you know, so pretty simple, easy to operate. It's a good little engine. Um, air cooled. I think I believe it's a 20 horsepower. A little more horsepower than you really need, so you don't need that engine screaming to get performance out of the hydraulic system. Um, in between the hydraulic tank and the engine uh, is a spin-on oil filter. I'm going to move the camera a little bit because we're going to talk a little bit about this burner system uh, and how that works. All right, so we're going to talk about the LP system. Um, you've actually got a pilot light and a main burner. So the pilot light's the smaller burner. The pilot light has um, a spark ignition and a flame sensor in it. So it senses if the flame, if there's flame. Uh, if it doesn't sense flame once it tries to light, it's going to try to relight. If it doesn't relight the second time, then it's going to go into a lockout mode. If it goes into lockout, you have to turn the power off and turn it back on to try to cycle it. A um, couple reasons why it could go into lockout. No fuel, out of fuel, uh, blows out, you've got a plugged orifice. Those could all be things that could potentially cause a problem, you know, why that pilot light wouldn't light. Um, I'll kind of, I'll, I'll start at the top. Your top, here's a filter. Uh, then we have a pressure relief, same kind of pressure relief you have on an LP tank. Uh, then you have a pressure regulator with a gauge. Um, this is a liquid withdrawal system, so what that means is it goes to the bottom in the tank. There's a valve that goes to the bottom and sucks the liquid out. We actually vaporize it right before we burn it. Uh, the reason we do that is you can get more BTUs out of a vapor or a liquid system than you can out of a vapor system. Like your gas grill at home is a vapor system. Um, so on the pressure regulator, people think, oh, I turn it up, I get more heat. Not necessarily the case. 11 to 22 PSI. Uh, most of them leave the factory, you know, 18, maybe 20 PSI. Um, but you don't, you know, turning up the regulator is not necessarily going to give you more heat. And there's another pressure uh, relief in here. Then you have your first solenoid. This is your main shutoff solenoid. So when, when you turn the power switch off in the control box, which we'll go over here in just a minute, it's going to shut that fuel off, which won't allow any more fuel to go down. Uh, when I turn the power switch on, it opens that valve and allows fuel to come up here to our pilot light, which is this, this aluminum line. There is a filter and a pre-orifice in this filter. Uh, and then there's also an orifice on the back of that small pilot light. So when you hit the power switch, it's going to click, click, click. The pilot light's going to come on. Then um, the next thing is if the thermostat were to call for heat, then it's going to open up this valve, which will allow fuel to go down to the main burner. 
you also have a, what, we, what we call a 104 valve um, that will shut the main burner off. I'm going to actually flip it on here so you can hear it. So the pilot light comes on. My call for heat light is on. So I always like to do that, make sure I got the pilot light going. shut that off so I don't have to talk over it so you guys kind of get the gist now you know if that if that thermostat say we get our product up to temperature the burner's going to kick out but the pilot light will still run uh, so you get a little bit of heat off the pilot light and then when it calls for heat again you click so we'll shut that off so we don't have to talk over it uh, so pretty simple system your brain box is here, so that's it. taking that signal from the pilot light that's saying, hey, I'm lit, I got, I got heat, comes back into here, that tells that to continue to, you know, keep supplying fuel. Uh, we're gonna reposition the camera again, so that's kind of the burn, oh, one last thing I'll tell you, the temperature probe's here, so that slid down inside the tank, there's a pipe inside the tank that that slides into. Um, so we're sensing the heat in the hottest part of the kettle, um, so you might see a little differential because I don't want to overheat the product, especially on a 500 gallon kettle, especially when you first turn it on. It takes a little bit for that heat to get cycled, you know, through that whole take of product. Um, one of the things that will help that is if you turn the pump on and recirculate, moves that product around inside the tank. Um, we're going to swing the camera around to the controls here so I can talk about them for a minute and then we'll get to the back end and the plum, plumbing and pumping system. Alright, so we've got a clear cover, plexiglass cover, or a Lexan cover over the controls that protects it. Uh, you got a couple things going on. Obviously you got your main power switch for your burner, which you click up. that will turn your pilot light on. Uh, you can see we're calling for heat. I turned the burner off so we don't have to talk over it. The top temperature is what we're reading. The bottom temperature is what we're set at. So if I want to change that, you know, you've got your up and down arrow. So right now, it's a little hard to see in the sunlight. Uh, we're 75 degrees is what we're reading. I'm going to set the temperature of our product, say, at 140. So you can just push and hold. It'll ramp up. You know, and as it comes up to one, your temperature will start to climb, you know, with your burner. It'll come up to temperature and then shut the burner off with the pilot light on. You also have a voltmeter in there just so you see what your your uh, uh, volts are. Once we get up to temperature, that call for heat will go off. I'm just going to turn this down. So now I turned it down to 60. I'm just artificially inflating that. You'll see the call for heat light comes out. That means that the burner should shut off. Um, there's no there's no uh, fuses in the system. There's only a resettable circuit breaker, so if for some reason a wire gets shorted out, it's going to pop that breaker. This system's pretty simple. There's not a lot going on. Um, you know, it's a pretty simple control box. Uh, this particular unit does not have a washdown system on it, so that would shut it off if it did. Turn the pump on. And again, it's got a strobe light switch, but this particular unit does not have a strobe light. If you ever want to add one, it's wired in for it already. Um, so that's the controls in a nutshell, pretty simple. This is burner controls. Now we're going to swing around to the back and show you how the pump and, and all that stuff works. All right, I want to talk for just a minute about the manway cover and your overflow. So this is your overflow and also your vent pipe. Um, so you do need to make sure that that stays open. You might get a little, uh, you know, depending on what type of product, you may get a little bit of drippage out of that because, you know, whenever you heat oil, there's light oils um, that are in there. Um, I always recommend that when you are transporting the machine that you lock the manway cover. Once you get to the job site, you can unlock it, or when you're heating it, I suggest that you unlock the lid. So that allows for emergency venting you know, in the event of a flash, depending on what type of product you're using. This kettle doesn't necessarily care. It's probably the most versatile kettle for different types of product. You can run a water-based emulsion, you can run an MC, or even an AC type uh, asphalt in here. Um, so it's, a, like I said, pretty versatile, pretty easy to use and operate um, kettle. Um, with that, we're about wrapped up. All right, so 
Now we're going to show you how the pumping system works. It's a pretty simple, easy system. Uh, you've got a 20 GPM Viking HL32 pump. That's located right here, driven by a hydraulic motor, direct coupled. Um, one bit of maintenance is there is a packing gland on the pump, so if you notice it's starting to leak, there's two nuts. You turn each nut anywhere from a quarter to a half a turn, uh, and that squishes that packing rings around the shaft to prevent it from, from leaking. That is a maintenance item, that's something that you will have to maintain. Um, it takes a long time before you wear out the pump, years probably, uh, in most applications. Uh, if you notice it's starting to drip, just you know, put a wrench on it, tighten it up. You've got four valves in the system, five counting the hydraulic valve. Very simple and easy system to operate. Uh, the first two valves are product or flush, pretty simple. Pick one. Do I want to flush it or do I want product? Um, today we're going to do most of it in product because i got some water in here so I can show you how this thing works. And then you've got recirculator spray bar. If I go to recirculate, I'll show you on the tag, it says recirc. The valves are new so they're stiff. So basically what's happening is the product's coming up from the tank into the pump, out of the pump coming into this T. If it's in recirculate, it goes over here, it goes back down into the tank. Or if we're in spray bar mode, it sends the flow through the spray bar. So it's a full circulating spray bar. So when we're sitting here waiting to, to spray, that oil is going through that spray bar back to tank, all the way through that. So it's keeping everything warm and clean and keeping that pump going. At some point, you're gonna have a problem with a bad batch of oil or someone forgets to flush out the pump and the pump is locked up. It's okay to take a small hand torch, not the big weed burner, big Bertha torch, but a small hand torch and heat this pump up. You can heat the head up and then the, the casing, you know, and that'll help get that going. Especially if you're using a water-based emulsion and you get it, suck up a glob of crap in there, you know, you can thaw that out. Um, but when I, you know, when I'm in the, in the research position, we're going to either use the wand or right back to tank. When I'm in the spray bar mode, we're going through the bar and back to the tank. Uh, so again, pretty simple to operate. Um, we're going to fire it up here just a little bit and, and show you how it operates. But there's a couple other things I want to talk about. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's, uh, it is set up with a hydraulic valve to run your pump forward and reverse. And it's also got a tether. Uh, that you'd string up in the cab. I got it back here for, for our demonstration purposes. But I want to talk about this, this uh, hydraulic valve. It is a flow control valve. So it's a 20 gallon per minute pump. If we're just using the hand wand, we don't need 20 gallons a minute. If you're using the spray bar, you're gonna maybe need a little bit more pressure. Again, the engine's big. If you're just using the hand wand, I probably don't need it much off an idle. Um, and and the, it, that includes the pump. I don't need that thing spinning very fast. This is a flow control hydraulic valve. The farther I stroke it, the faster it goes. Once I fire it up, you'll see that. Um, so you don't have to be all the way on or all the way off. It's flow control. You can control the speed, which will control the pressure out of your spray bar or your hand wand. Um, that's the only way to control the pressure on the bar. On the hand wand, you're gonna control it here, but then there's also a feathering valve or a, what we call a WPC, one pressure control valve, WPC, um, that will also control your flow. Uh, one, again, once I fire it up, you'll kind of see how both of those work. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit more about the plumbing. So once we're done for the night, then we're going to flush it. So this unit has a fl five gallon flush tank mounted on it, <coughs> and it is set up to recirculate the flush. Uh, you can either choose to recirculate it back in here and empty this out every night, or you can you know, spray it onto the ground uh, or into your pit or whatever. Um, I suggest, you know, capturing it in here and draining it off as as, uh, as you use it. Uh, again, there's just two valves. It's really simple to flush it. The two main components that need to be flushed, number one is the pump because it's a tight tolerance because there's two gears in there that mesh that causes pressure to pressurize that spray bar. The other one is the spray bar or spray wand nozzle. Uh, those are the two smallest orifices or clearances in this system. I like to personally take the nozzle out when I flush it at the end of the night just because it helps speed things up. Uh, you can suck the product back into the tank. Um, the pump's designed to pump, not to suck, but it will suck also. Uh, so you can suck back 
much of the product as you want back into the tank before you flush it because then you'll have less dirty flush. Um, we do also have an option for a bigger flush tank. Um, you know, 15 gallon versus the five gives you more flush. You can flush more times, um, you know, so that can be added to this unit also, or you could spec it with that. Um, that is the more common option, the 15 gallon, just because then you have more cleaning solvent with you. Uh, I do want to talk about the spray bar a little bit. It's kind of cool. It's just got a, a linkage. Actually, I can run this one. It's, um, you can see the linkage just moves the valves and opens and closes it. I mean, that's just gravity. You know water coming out of there you know so that linkage opens and closes you can see it's an electric actuator so it's not you know it's not fast um, but without an air compressor it's hard to get fast what is cool on each one of these though wiggle that just a little bit is I can configure my spray bar however I want so if I want say I only want to spray two feet I could turn all of these disconnect all of these nozzles just by pulling this pin, popping that washer off and disconnecting that from the linkage that actuates. Um, so if I want real light coverage, I could go every other one. If I want, like I say, I'm spraying a shoulder, you can just spray the shoulder. Um, and it's as simple as, you know, disconnecting the pin and the, and the pulling the washer off of there. All right, so I'm gonna fire up the engine so that we can spray a little bit so you can see how this all operates. Pumps in neutral.
recommend you just put the pump in reverse, suck that pressure off. And otherwise, when you unscrew it, it's going to spurt at you. Yeah, so take caution like that. I'm going to shut the engine off and I'll let it up. All right, so now when we're done for the night, we need to flush it. So we'd normally leave the engine running, but I'm done spraying product. You're gonna put the pump in neutral and then move your valves from product to flush. There's two valves that you need to do. Whatever function you use today, so say I only use the hose and wand, I need to flush that out. I wouldn't necessarily need to flush out the spray bar. Uh, if I only use the spray bar, I need to flush out the spray bar. Um, but like I said, you know, the flush is where usually people make the mistake. They don't flush it or they forget to flush it. If you do that, don't panic. You just got to get a little heat on that pump to get it turning. Uh, the hydraulic system's got a relief valve, so if the pump is locked up, it's got some hard tar in it, it's not going to hurt anything for a, for a few minutes. I mean, you don't want to leave it in relief for hours. Uh, but, you know, if you can't get that pump turning in the morning, get a little heat on that pump. Um, once you get some heat in there, that warm product will help warm things up and get things flowing. Um, so again, pretty simple. The spray bar does have, um, there's two pins here. You can adjust the height level. The higher it is, uh, the better you'll get double and triple coverage. The downside is uh, you get more overspray when the bar is higher. So depends on what you're doing. If you're just spraying tack oil and you're not putting a lot of product down, you can have the bar a little higher. Uh, if it's really windy, like it's pretty windy today, you know, I'd maybe get that bar a little lower. The downside of having the bar lower is if you do get a plug in one of the nozzles, then you're going to get a streak where you don't have, have tar. Um, pretty, like I said, pretty simple unit to use, pretty easy to operate. Um, you know, if you do have questions on the operation or, or how something works, you know, feel free to give us a call anytime. We've got good service um, videos and, and things like that for the burner systems and, and all of this. Um, with that, I'd like to say thank you for your purchase. If you have any questions or concerns or would like to buy some more equipment, feel free to give us a call at 651-674-4491. Thanks again for your business.